welcome to the uh, Global Mail Center. We moved into this uh, lovely space uh, nearly a year ago, uh, just before Christmas last year, from a dark and dingy building on the other side of the city center. So this is a uh, night and day difference, and the staff love it. Uh, and this event space has become uh, one of the hottest venues in town. So you're seeing it on a lovely morning with the lake glistening, uh, as opposed to Monday morning when you couldn't see anything out the window because of the fog. So you struck lucky on the weather today. Anyway, welcome to the Globe. We're very glad that we can uh, host this event today. Uh, as you may know, this uh, is very close to what was the site of the first parliament. So this is a historic part of the city. Um, it's also been the home of the indigenous people for thousands of, thousands of years, uh, particularly the, uh, the Mississaugas of the New Credit most recently. Uh, so we honor those people today. Um, the event has come together very quickly. So forgive us if there's any uh, little glitches along the way because there's been a lot of people working very hard very quickly over the last few weeks to uh, get this event on both yesterday and today. And I gather the round tables that were held yesterday were very productive. And uh, I think you will uh, get the benefit of the wisdom from those sessions yesterday. Um, I think it's pretty clear that uh, many Canadian women have been suffering in silence for many years. And uh, now there, there is a platform where that voice can be heard. So um, we look forward to see what can come out of today. Um, and we'll try and make sure that uh, all those voices are heard. Uh, I'd like to ask David Wormsley, the Globe and Mail's Editor-in-Chief, to say a few words um, before we get into the program. Thank you. Thanks, Philip, and uh, good morning to you all. Thanks for your interest. I think it's uh, no coincidence that today marks the anniversary of the L'Ecole Polytechnique massacre. And uh, we're certainly thinking not only of all of those who lost their lives then, but if we look at the arc of the story over the last number of years, there's still a lot to be done. And that's something that the Globe and Mail has recognized for a long time. Uh, since I've become the editor, I have been fixated by this notion that while the Globe focuses very well on policy and on institutions, there are gaps sometimes, and I think that journalism can bridge that divide and can be the glue that can allow for voices to be heard that otherwise are not heard. We've done series on examples including trafficked women, a very difficult story to get at because they're being trafficked and they're hidden and they're beyond our sight, and we need to make them visible. And murdered and missing women, that's a permanent inquiry on behalf of the Globe and Mail to help everyone to understand better what has gone on where the disappeared are, and how do we solve that intractable problem. It's not easy, and it takes a long time, and that's something that journalism can do. It isn't always about being immediate. But perhaps the best example that we have, of course, has been unfounded. The seminal investigation took 20 months with a dedicated team, full time, looking into how sexual assault in Canada was prosecuted or not prosecuted. And the most shocking example of that was that those who went to the police far too often, indeed on an industrial scale, were not believed. And we gave voice to those people. And the work that we did got noticed by the police forces. To their credit, they have improved. And to the federal government, who provided $100 million to help support those forces and the training systems that had been in deficit. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce now the reporter who led that work, Robin Doolittle. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. This is just an incredible event. I can't believe how fast it came together. Um, as, uh, as David mentioned, 
Um, I was on the, the team that did the unfounded investigation. So I'm a, a, a member of the Globe and Mail's investigative team. And in June 2015, it seemed that no matter where I was in the city, I kept getting into the same conversation over and over and over again that the system was failing sexual assault victims. And it got me thinking, is there a story here? Is there something that can be done? And what we ended up focusing on was this very specific statistic around when police move forward with a case or don't. They decide this case is unfounded, this allegation didn't occur, or it's worthy of a more robust investigation. And after hundreds of freedom of information requests collecting data from more than 870 police jurisdictions, what we learned is that on average, one out of every five sexual assault claims reported to Canadian police was being dismissed as invalid. And when a case ends up unfounded, it wasn't reported to Statistics Canada, it was essentially scrubbed from the public record. Now there are really real implications here for public policy because decision makers and lawmakers rely on those stats uh, to make evidence-based decisions around funding for victims' resources as well as police services. The unfounded investigation is, is actually a good news story in the end, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I did want to highlight another story that I think is almost more appropriate for this venue, and it's one that really stuck with me. Um, the other part of the unfounded investigation was the people. So we did a lot of work on the data, but I also investigated more than 50 specific claims of sexual assault. And there's one that, that, again, I keep coming back to because I can imagine myself as this girl. This was the story of 17-year-old Maddie. Um, Maddie, uh, this was you know, just a couple of years ago. She's still a teenager today. And Maddie woke up one morning after um, being out with her friends and she had been drinking and she texted her mother, I, I think I've been raped, from her bedroom upstairs because she didn't want to talk to her mother about it directly. Her mother runs upstairs, they have a conversation, she's very upset, they go to the police service, her mother says she's very nervous, she's afraid the kids at school are going to be mad at her, um, that she's, she's worried how it's going to impact his life. Um, and her mother says, just, just trust the officers. Go in, tell your story, let them decide. So they go into this police service and she's sitting on this couch and there's actually, she's sitting there with her parents before the officer comes in and she's talking about, about her concerns. The officer knocks on the door, says it's time, to, it's time for the interview. Her mother kisses her on her cheek, says I'm right outside and leaves. And um, as Maddie starts, the officer sits down, says, I'm going to record this video. And before she even starts to tell her story, the officer says, I don't um, necessarily think a criminal charge is warranted here. Before she even starts to tell her story. And as Maddie then recounts what happened through the night, um, the officer doesn't really ask her any questions about what happened. She finally comes back, this is about 20 minutes in, and asks Maddie a series of questions such as, what were you wearing? How much did he have to drink? Was your clothing ripped? Have you ever had sex before? Do you have a boyfriend? 30 minutes in, the officer says, quote, I think there may have been a misunderstanding on his end, believing that there was consent. A person who was highly intoxicated cannot give consent, but my only concern is that it sounds like he was intoxicated at the same time. So I think educating him is a good thing, but I think educating you is a good thing too, because you have to take a little bit of responsibility as well, right? You unfortunately drank too much. At this point, the officer had not done any work at all on this investigation, hadn't interviewed the suspect, hadn't looked for any witnesses. She just sat down and done this case. The purpose of the unfounded investigation was not to prove whether someone had been raped or not raped. It was purely looking at the police response. And what we know for sure around this case is that a teenager went to her police service, she was frightened, 
And she told the officer what happened, and she left feeling ashamed and embarrassed. And to this day, still feels ashamed and embarrassed because of what happened in that room. She was not so concerned that the individual was not charged. She was just doing what she thought she's supposed to do in that situation. And I was a teenager. I went to university. I could easily have been Maddie. And that's why these stories really resonated with me. Um, what happened to Maddie, the unfounded investigation, Harvey Weinstein, Me Too, all of these ills are dredged from this same pool of misogyny. And what's great about days like today and hopefully the work that we're doing at the Globe is that this is time to drain that swamp. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's my honor to speak here today. And I'd like to now welcome the organizing committee of Me Too who have pulled this together um, in such short time. Uh, so give them a round of applause. Thank you for being here. I'm Ashling Chin Yi, and alongside Freya Ravensbergen and Mia Kirshner, we created the After Me Too Symposium four weeks ago. <laughs> so several weeks ago, a shift in culture started to happen. The hashtag Me Too movement rang with the voices of those speaking out about sexual abuse, assault, and harassment in the entertainment industry. The movement began 10 years ago with the work of Tarana Burke, an activist and social worker, and it became a hashtag rallying cry as film and television professionals began to publicly declare that we have a collective desire to change the culture, put the survivors first, and to accept nothing less than a workplace that is safe, respectful, tra transparent, and promises to respond to the claims of sexual misconduct. And today, the Me Too movement has been named Time Magazine's Person of the Year, and they are calling them the Silence Breakers. <laughs> calling us the Silence Breakers. So, we are a group of individuals behind the discussions that took place and will take place in, in, as part of the After Me Too Symposium. And because of what happened a few weeks ago, and because of our stories getting heard, we finally had your attention, and we finally had the attention of our own industry. So yesterday and this morning, about finishing like 10 minutes ago, we hosted a series of roundtable discussions focused on em empathetic conversations between professionals from all aspects of the TV and film industry, civil and criminal legal experts, organizational change experts, psychologists, and trauma experts with decades of experience of studying abuse. Our hope for this multifaceted approach is to discuss the issue of, se of sexual misconduct, the barriers in the current systems, and to find solutions to change the system so that it works to protect us and to put the survivors first. So each of these 10 round tables comprised of professionals uh, comprised of professional sectors and expertise to, be to begin and create a holistic understanding of the issues we face within the industry, within our culture, and what realities women and men face in other workspaces as well. We filmed the tables and they will be released for the public to see online in early 2018. They will be available episodically on the aftermeetoo.com website. So as well, we will compile a report of recommendations that grew out of our discussions here. This report, we hope, will, forward, will, will be forward-moving, actionable, and, consider, and be considered a tool of engagement and a change by the institutions, government, and by those with power, and that they will take the, who and will take the issue seriously. Here is a summary of the recommendations that came out of the round tables. For transforming the industry culture, one, unified industry-wide response to sexualized violence, harmonizing policies of existing unions, protocols to trigger complementary mechanisms of reporting, case tracking, investigation, and blacklisting prevention. This may include amending Canadian labor laws. 
Number two, expand the definition of workplace. It is about people, not places. Include any environment where there is a business relationship between individuals, such as wrap parties, networking functions, and promotional events. This can be done through collective agreements, harassment prevention policies, and or legislative measures. Number three, we have gaps in our knowledge. Mandatory yearly education for all industry members, including producers, directors, crew and performers on employer harassment prevention policies, bystander intervention, and how to report and how to report and industry professionalism. For support to survivors. Number four. All industry members must pay to, into a fund, like we already have, to pensions and benefits designed to address the harms and increase accountability for survivors of sexualized violence and harassment in the industry. This could fund trauma-informed mental health care or um, a certain number of hours of free legal advice with a lawyer of the survivor's choice. Number five. Governments must provide better universal and timely access to this medically necessary mental health supports and or trauma-informed psychological supports for survivors of sexualized violence. For the reporting process, number six, develop online reporting systems that allow victims and survivors to report and disclose incidents of sexual violence. This, this system centers the lived experience of survivors with the aim of minimalizing re-traumatization. And number seven, immediate action to establish an independent national body for all industry members. No more conflicts of interest. This body would receive and investigate reports of sexualized violence where a formal report is filed, the body would conduct independent expert investigations and have the power to resolve by measure that include compensa comp compensatory, systemic, and punitive measures. So that's a rundown that will be clearly released in a formal report. So if you have more interest in reading more about that, because I know that's a quick run through of it, um, it will be available for you. Um, as you know, today is the National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women. We chose this day um, when Mia Ashling and I came together just a short three weeks ago um, to start the After Me Too um, collective. We were greeted with a wave of support, talent, and the strength and power of women and men. We are a core group, all volunteering our time, our resources, and expertise to make this happen. We'd like to acknowledge the frontline workers, rape crisis centers, and advocates who have devoted their life's work to supporting survivors. They are people who are doing important work every day, in and out, day in and day out. What started as a response to the terrible abuse from powerful men in the entertainment industry has grown into a public outcry that we will not accept this type of behavior in our workspaces, in our homes, our schools, and in our streets. What we saw, putting this together was that society does want change and we want to see it now. Our hearts and our minds are fueled to move forward. And we hope that this symposium, the roundtable discussions that you'll soon be able to watch online, and the report that we release in the coming year is a part of the change that needs to happen. We also recognize and we want to advise that working on this issue has been emotional for all of us involved. Um, I'm sure it's emotional for many of you um, and your experiences. We do have a psychologist here um, and a safe place to sit if you feel like you need to leave at any time um, during the panel discussion or afterwards. There have been many difficult moments for each of us, um, each of our own personal experiences with harassment, assault, and abuse. So we do advise that if you do feel triggered in any way, please ask for help. For today's town hall to work, we need to be clear about our focus. After Me Too is about focusing on solutions. We know that many of you in this room have been drawn to this town hall because of the shared feelings of outrage and hurt. But I must stress that today is not about naming names. If you do have information or a story tip you'd like to pass on to a Globe and Mail reporter, then please touch base with a volunteer today. Or you can always share a story tip anonymously for Globe reporters via Secure Drop, 
which you can look up at theglobeandmail.com. Today we have a short time and we want to accomplish something big. Let's use this time to talk about the next steps and how to see systemic change, the systemic change that we need. Thank you again for coming. Thank you to everyone who participated, who shared their story, who spoke up or who supported in any way. And thank you to the ones who are still silent and suffering. The systems that failed you need to change. Let us all be a part of that change and let's demand that it happens now. Hello and thank you so much uh, for your words, the organizers of After Me Too. I'm Hannah Sung here at the Globe and Mail. I've been working with them and it's been tireless work. It's really been incredible and we are so honored to have here today the Minister of Justice, Jody Wilson-Raybould, to give our keynote speech. Thank you. Well, uh, good morning, Gaila Kessler, everyone. Uh, thank you for for welcoming me here to the to the Globe and Mail, the me or after me to event um, uh, to this beautiful facility and allowing me to say some some words. I um, also wanted to acknowledge the uh, traditional territory of Mississaugas of the New Credit and the the gathering place of the Haudenosaunee. So, to the journalists at the Globe and Mail and your colleagues in the industry. I want to thank you in my capacity as an Indigenous woman, a lawyer and the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of Canada. Your important work has shone a light on the troubling prevalence of violence, sexual harassment, sexual assault within our society, within our country. Shone a light on patterns of behavior that are not reflective of how we hold ourselves up as Canadians. Your reporting has put this issue at the front of mind for many, regardless of how we might think we see ourselves. So for me personally, as an Indigenous woman, it particularly resonates given the history of colonization and its enduring legacy. And in thinking about what I would say to you all today, um, whether thinking about um, uh, society generally or in the heightened um, context of being Indigenous, it is not without significance, as was mentioned, that we have an inquiry into murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. I could not help but think of my own life and to reflect on my family, my friends, my colleagues, and those that have been affected, and how I have managed to, how I've managed and coped. Farther it, uh, or further, it caused me to reflect on how normalized these patterns of behavior have become. So for your leadership in hosting events such as today's town hall, uh, this demonstrates the critical role that journal journalism plays in raising awareness and instigating social change, especially when such change is so long overdue, so thank you. To the survivors of sexual harassment and violence, I hear you, we hear you. We acknowledge your pain and your courage is commendable. Your lived experience is valued. Thank you for being here and thank you for sharing your stories. As was mentioned, today we remember the 14 young women in Montreal who were victims of the most extreme form of gender-based violence. These women were killed precisely because they were women by a man who claimed to be fighting feminism. Quite apart from that extreme form of gender-based violence, Far too many women and vulnerable people continue to live silently with the prospect that they could be harassed, assaulted, or even gravely harmed because they are women and girls or from a vulnerable population. 
We, as women and girls, still face significant structural institutional inequalities, and these inequalities too often allow violence and misogyny to manifest. For persons from vulnerable or marginalized groups, such as many indigenous peoples, it is also true. And if female, it is compounded. But I, like all of you, am one for breaking down barriers. So let's get started. Sexual harassment and violence must stop. We must break past patterns of behavior. It does not matter if it is in the home, on the streets, in our schools, or in our workplaces. It does not matter if it comes from a lover, a family member, a friend, a colleague, or an employer. Sexual harassment, sexual violence is deplorable, and it must end. Sexual harassment is not just having fun. It's not just how it is. Sexual harassment is unacceptable, and the days of victim shaming are over. Victims are not just sensitive. They do not lack a sense of humor, and they are not just feminists. When a harasser is denounced, we are not ruffling feathers or creating a stir. We are ending violence. The tacit enabling of harassers through silence is utterly unacceptable. Each and every one of us has a role to play. All peoples of all genders must find their voice and acknowledge their role in stopping this conduct. To do this, we must all open our eyes to the prevalence of sexual violence and harassment, their insidious forms and the devastating consequences they have for individuals, families, and communities. Together, we must turn this page into history. Each and every one of us is responsible for what happens next. What will you say when someone makes a comment, a derogatory comment, in the lunchroom, at the conference table, or in the locker room? What will you do if your boss disparages your colleague on the basis of their gender? How will you react if your friend tells you that they were groped at a Christmas party? Will you believe them and help to protect them from retaliation? A brave person can stand up to his or her enemies, but it takes true courage to stand up for your friends or superiors. Will you? Silence creates a culture of complicity. Cultures of harassment exist because people do not hold others accountable of unacceptable behavior. One of the main reasons victims, as has been said, are afraid to come forward is fear of re-victimization, fear of re-traumatization. As more stories of sexual harassment and sexual assault are told, we must ensure that survivors are heard and that we are ready to support them. I want to commend Mia Kirshner, Freya, Ashling, and everyone in this room for bringing this critical issue to light. I want to acknowledge your bravery. By coming forward with your own experiences, you have ignited a spark that helped make these discussions possible. You created a space where survivors can lend their voice to yours. So thank you. And to all of you, to my colleagues in Ottawa, to my fellow Canadians, I ask, will you create this space for dialogue in your home at your workplace, a space where healing and learning can take place? Will you treat survivors with compassion and respect? Will you listen to them without judgment? So throughout my career, um, first as a Crown Prosecutor, then as a Treaty Commissioner, and the Regional Chief of the BC Assembly of First Nations, I heard many of these stories and saw firsthand the devastating impact that sexual assaults can have on victims and survivors who are disproportionately women. 
Sadly, I have seen this violence occur in every corner of every space that I have occupied. But I have also seen leadership in the face of such violence. So I'm fortunate to come from a loving, very loving and supportive family. Um, my grandmother, Pugladi, raised my sister and me to know where we came from, to know who we are, and to work hard for our success. She ensured that we knew our culture, our values, the laws of the big house, and how to conduct oneself as a leader. Her values and perspectives, like mine, were formed being born into the Eagle Clan of the Muskema, Tsaudenuk, and Lichlikta people, part of the Kwakwakiwak Nation of Northern Vancouver Island. We are a matrilineal society. Matrilineal meaning that property descends through the female line. In our system, I am haligilasti, a role always held by women. One of my jobs is to lead my hamatsa, the chief, into the big house. This role can be translated into one that corrects the chief's path. We show them the way, a metaphor for life, perhaps some food for thought for today, and in the potlatch symbolized in our rituals where now symbolically the power of the hamatsa is tamed and he becomes ready to be chief. So my grandmother used to always joke that um, with us that when it came to the respective roles of women and men that women were far too busy and important to be chiefs. Kind of a joke, but not really. Um, we come from a communitarian culture. Everybody in our culture, in our society, has a role to play in making the community work well. The roles are very different, but equally important in terms of the ensuring the community functions the way that it should. I call it balance. In fact, our whole system was about balance, is about balance between men and women, between clans and between tribes. These are the teachings that I bring and have brought to every role that I've held. So now as Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of Canada, I know and most importantly, I accept that I have a role to play in stopping violence. I understand, um, or I undertake to leave the criminal justice system and the judiciary better equipped to address sexual violence in Canada. Along with my colleagues, I am committed to taking bold steps to reduce sexual violence and harassment and to ensure that survivors are treated with respect and dignity. Many hold the view, understandably, that the law has failed victims of sexual violence. But it is not the laws on the books that have failed us. From a legal standpoint, as I know there's many lawyers in this room, Canada has some of the strongest laws in the world when it comes to sexual assault. Our criminal code clearly prohibits sexual assault in all its forms. Sexual assault being any physical contact with somebody without their consent that is of a sexual nature. The Criminal Code defines consent as the voluntary agreement to the sexual activity in question and clearly sets out circumstances where the law is not, where the law will not recognize consent, such as where the complaint, complainant consents because of threats or violence. Where an accused claims that they honestly but mistakenly believe that the complainant had consented, they must show that they took reasonable steps to ascertain that consent. These laws were not always as strong. Before 1983, the credibility of complainants in sexual assault cases could be attacked by asking them questions about their sexual history to suggest that they were less worthy of belief or more likely to have consented because of their sexual history. These are known as the twin myths. These myths were and continue to be a byproduct of misogyny. And they have been so endemic to the justice system that they required legislation to put an end to their use. 
The rape shield provisions in the criminal code now ensure that the use of evidence related to sexual history is strictly circumscribed. No longer can inferences and stereotypes about sexual assault victims uh, be used as part of defense. These amendments to the code, along with others, protect complainants from assumptions based on myths and stereotypes about how victims of sexual assault are expected to behave. This legislation, however, was not enough. It took renowned jurists to uphold and breathe life into the law. Indeed, Justice Sheila Martin, who was recently nominated by the Prime Minister of Canada to the Supreme Court of Canada, argued before that very court in Regina and Mills, seeking to uphold the constitutionality of the rape shield provisions in the face of a charter challenge. She succeeded. And yet, despite being upheld, the rape shield provisions in the criminal code have not adequately increased the rates of charging, prosecution, or conviction in sexual assault cases. They are significantly lower than any other type of violent crime. Let me share with you a shameful statistic. It is estimated that only 5% of sexual assaults are reported to police. For those that are reported, 37% resulted in charges in 2016. And in 2015, 16, 44% of accused were ultimately, um, or who ultimately appeared in adult court in sexual assault cases were found guilty. This means that less than 1% of those accused of sexual assault in Canada were convicted, or are convicted. Less than 1%. This is the lowest conviction rate for any type of violent crime in this country. This cannot stand. We must work together to combat the underlying factors that contribute to this broken system. Over the last year, media reports, particularly the Globe and Mail's award-winning investigative series, have highlighted a number of cases, an unacceptable high number, that police deemed unfounded and the reasons why. Victims of sexual assault still face significant barriers in reporting assaults, as we've heard, to police and testifying in court. Perhaps the greatest barrier that victims face are the myths and stereotypes that surround gender-based violence, which continue to surface at all stages of the criminal justice system. Indigenous, transgender, two-spirit, disabled, and other marginalized survivors of sexual assault face further barriers to justice, compounded by additional myths and stereotypes. Victims are re-victimized and the cycle of silence and violence continues. So where do we go from here? The first step is starting broad social dialogue, like the one we're having today. Survivors must be able to assert their right to be heard and must be able to talk about it in safe places. The second step is ensuring that our criminal justice system works. Every actor across Canada's criminal justice system must have the tools needed to better understand and apply the law. This includes specialized training on sexual assault law for police and Crown prosecutors, training for judges, and training for lawyers who wish to join the judiciary. This is why our government funded critical training for federal and provincial judges on gender-based violence, including sexual assault and domestic violence. And while our laws are strong, they can be strengthened. This is why we have sought to clarify and strengthen the sexual assault provisions in the criminal code through Bill C-51. Specifically, the system must understand that the rate shield provisions apply to sexual communications. But having strong laws on the books, as we have seen, is not always enough. We also need to look at new approaches. We must look beyond changes to the letter of the law for solutions and examine why the law is not being implied, applied and enforced as it should. It requires creating a system of public accountability for this type of violence. Which bring me, brings me to the third step. Transparency and accountability. 
Statistics on the prevalence of sexual violence must be brought to the public's attention. Statistics Canada is now putting into place standardized, a standardized process for collecting and using quality statistics on unfounded criminal incidences, including sexual assaults. The importance of this data, as has been stated, cannot be overemphasized. To effect change, we must understand the contours and causes of this violence. The unfounded series also highlighted ways in which the system for reporting and investigating sexual assaults and violence could be improved, such as the model developed in Philadelphia. As I've said in the past, I support such models to promote greater transparency and accountability. And our office has funded a pilot project in North Bay, which is based on the Philadelphia model. The fourth step in this journey is acknowledging that we do need to do more for survivors. This includes making sure our practices in dealing with survivors reflect an understanding of how trauma affects the brain and the ability to recall events. Per Bill C-51, Complainants must have the right to a lawyer in the courtroom when the court is determining whether to allow evidence of the complainant's sexual history to be admitted. This initiative, among others, have brought forward, or that we have brought forward, underscores the importance of treating victims with compassion in a manner that better meets the needs of vulnerable peoples and one that takes a more integrated approach to addressing and preventing crime. There are, of course, other needs as well. The better we understand and meet the needs of victims of crime, the more just and fair our criminal justice system will become. And this brings me to the last step in our journey together, a commitment that reaffirms my conviction every day. To stop sexual violence, we must stop sexism, misogyny, and discrimination. This requires breaking patterns of behavior that are at the core of the problem within our society. At all levels, we need to commit to achieving equality, denouncing discrimination, empowering vulnerable communities, tackling ongoing sexism, homophobia, transphobia in all its forms, and to ensure that everyone can live their full potential. When Prime Minister Trudeau spoke at the United Nations General Assembly recently, he reaffirmed that Canada is one of the most diverse, peaceful, democratic, respectful, and cohesive nations on earth. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms reflects the, these values and beliefs. And because of the Charter, we are all equal before and under the law, regardless of who we are, where we come from, or who we love. And as we celebrate its 35th anniversary this year, we also celebrate what it means to be Canadian. Each of us can be a force for progress, compassion, and fairness, both in Canada and around the world. As Minister of Justice and Attorney General, it is my job to ensure our laws and our programs reflect these values. For example, we must ensure that the families of the murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls have their questions answered from government agencies. We must fund culturally grounded trauma-informed services to support Indigenous victims and survivors of crime, as my department has done across the country. The cycle of violence must end. And within our own house, we must ensure that federally regulated workplaces, including Parliament Hill, are free from harassment and sexual violence. I'm incredibly proud of the steps that my colleague, Minister Patty Haidu, took last month to address sexual harassment in the workplace and on the Hill. And, the, and although I'm proud to be a part of a federal cabinet that is gender balanced, only one in four members of Parliament are female. This is unacceptable. We must continue to work promptly and decisively towards true gender equality in all spheres of society. And at a global level, Canada has a role to play. But we must lead by example. And when we do, we must help to seek to eliminate barriers everywhere and elsewhere. Addressing the challenges that prevent women and girls from reaching their full potential. Women must be empowered to improve their lives and those of their families, communities, and countries. 
whether here at home or abroad. Simply put, empowering women and girls empowers humanity. It creates balance in society, ensuring that we are firing on all cylinders. Last month, our government released Canada's second national action plan on women, peace, and security. The action plan will guide Canada's ex, um, efforts over the next five years to advance the role of women and girls and to protect their human rights in fragile conflicts or post-conflict countries and in all stages of peace. So as we reflect and look forward, in many ways and for many people who have been unfairly treated or ignored, as part of the national conversation, the tide is turning. This is a day of reckoning. The flywheel is in motion. And let us use this momentum for real change. So I will ask, what happens after we say, I hear you, or you deserve more, or me too? Or I pledge to end sexual violence and harassment? What happens after we acknowledge that women and girls and members of vulnerable communities are equal? How do we translate belief into action? For the conversation does not end there, a fact that has been brought into sharp relief by a story told to me by my father, Bill Wilson, a story that was televised nationally. So in 1983, during the Constitutional Conferences on Aboriginal Self-Government, my father, a well-known Indigenous leader, told then Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau, quote, I have two children in Vancouver Island, both of whom for some misguided reason say they want to be lawyers, both of whom want to be the Prime Minister. <laughs> this statement elicited chuckles in the room. Unbelievably, however, these chuckles turned into outright laughter when my father said, both of whom, Prime Minister, are women. The audience laughed at the notion that a woman, let alone an Indigenous woman, could ever be Prime Minister. The audience laughed at the dreams of young Indigenous girls. The audience laughed at my father's conviction that his daughters deserved a seat at the table. I love my father and I love his convictions. His comments and the audience's reactions highlighted the barriers faced by women, especially Indigenous women. That was 1983. I like to think that we have come a long way since then, and in many ways we certainly have. I am here as Mo Jag, um, working for an amazing feminist prime minister, and you are all here. But what is troubling still is that below the surface, the vestiges of intolerance still linger, manifesting themselves at times into overt harassment and outright violence. And this must be of concern to all of us. So in conclusion, and in addition to listening to survivors and building on the commitment I talked about earlier, we must always speak out against sexual harassment and violence intervene when we see acts of gender-based violence when we can do so safely, take action by creating space for these discussions in our communities, lead by example, and know that your words and actions matter. Your voice matters. Like the government's 16 days of activism against gender-based violence initiative, an initiative that will end on December the 10th, I urge you to continue to affirm that everyone has the right to live a life free of violence. We must all take action to end gender-based violence. We must acknowledge our collective responsibility. We must move together towards inclusivity. Broader societal forces create and influence attitudes, and while they created the prevalence of gender-based violence, they will also end it. We will tame the Hamatsa, and we will achieve balance. Those attitudes that condoned harassment and violence resulting in a culture of silence that muted the denunciation of perpetrators are yielding to new societal forces. Courage and compassion are the strengths that have broken the silence. 
These strengths run deep in those who have come forward in recent weeks to recount in detail their stories of harassment and abuse in the workplace, at home, and throughout society. Some only felt comfortable to say me too. All of them are asking in their way to acknowledge them. And we do, we must, and all of them are counting on us to take action after Me Too to ensure that the culture of violence and harassment ends. And we will, we must. Gala Kusla, thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you for your leadership in this regard. Thank you so much to the Minister of Justice, Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould for your inspiring words and for your support of After Me Too. Hi everyone, I'm Angela Pacenza. I'm Head of Newsroom Development here at The Globe and Mail, um, where I focus on culture change, diversity, and building a better newsroom. I'm going to be moderating um, this morning's panel. So we know what brought us all here today um, and what brought the After Me Too um, campaign together. Um, we want to talk about what's next. We want to try to talk about practical solutions for survivor-centered reform. And more importantly, we want to talk about how we make this stick and actually have long-term um, change. And can it be a model for other sectors? So before we get started, I'll introduce our esteemed guests. Um, Nicole St. Martin is an actor who has worked in theater, film, and TV. She's an active member in ACTRA. So that's the union that represents about um, 20,000 professional performers in Canada. She's helped with several initiatives to get more women in front of and behind the camera. Thanks. Melanie Randall uh, teaches at Western University in the Faculty of Law. Her academic and advocacy work focus on legal remedies for gendered violence, as well as human rights and equity law. Jennifer Freed is a professor of psychology at the University of Oregon. She's an expert in trauma, who's known for her influential theories about sexual violence. She's done extensive research on sexual abuse and memory. Kishwar Iqbal is a talent agent who has worked with an array of actors, including Sarah Pauly, Scott Speedman, Ellen Page, to name a few. He's with the Gary Goddard Agency, which is based in Toronto. Hadia Roderick is a PhD candidate at the Rotman School of Management, studying organizational behavior. She's a lawyer by training and did a master's in criminology with a focus on sexual assault. She's also a journalist and podcast host. Ashling Ching Yi is a producer and director, and as you heard earlier, one of the founding members of After Me Too. She founded Fluent Films and is based in Montreal. So once our panel is done, we'll open up the floor for questions from the audience. There will be some volunteers walking around with microphones, and we will try to get to as many people as possible. So this is obviously a really grave subject and a difficult one to talk about. A lot of work was done yesterday in the roundtables, um, as we heard, to put together these concrete recommendations. So I'm not sure if they're on the screens, but I will read out a few others so that, just to inform the conversation. Um, so just to, to reiterate, um, one of them was to establish an investigative, an independent investigative body. Um, another was around harmonizing of policies across the industry to trigger complementary mechanisms for reporting, for case tracking, investigation, and back blacklisting prevention. Another was around expanding the definition of workplace to include any environment um, for the industry. So that would be wrap parties, networking functions, promotional events. So these sound sensible, right? <clears throat> so Nicole, let me throw it to you. Sure. <laughs> Do these sound, um, will these recommendations work? Do they sound like something we can build on? I think it's super important that we put them in practice. Uh, I think they will work. I think they'll have a huge impact, certainly in my situation, uh, going forward and actually complaining about the experience I had with someone, um, having to tell it to somebody who was their best friend. 
because you had to complain to somebody within the organization was terrifying and heartbreaking and uh, disheartening. And I just knew that I was alone in that moment. So having a third party do the work, or as you said, uh, what's the term you used? Um, an independent investigative body. Yeah. I think having an ind independent investigative body is essential because we cannot have colleagues and peers assessing situations. So I think that's really important. Okay. <clears throat> um, Melanie, um, if I can turn it to you, what do you think some of the hurdles to implementation would be? Um, <laughs> there's a lot of hurdles to implementation. There's a lot of resistance to change, and the legal system right now is already burdened and over uh, under-resourced. So there's already delay in uh, processing cases right now, and that's one of the biggest problems right now. We have a, a system that's groaning with a lack of resources, so that's a problem that I'm deeply concerned about. Okay. Jennifer, what about, what do you see as a hurdle? Um, well, I um, really would um, like to emphasize one of the recommendations I heard, and um, it would be a, an antidote to hurdles, I guess, which is education. I'm so struck by this moment in our society because I, I probably look at it a little bit differently than most people. I've been researching sexual violence for 25 years. And um, some of my colleagues here have as well. And um, we're very familiar with so many of the dynamics that are suddenly on the front pages of uh, newspapers. And we also have a lot of tools that can be used to address these issues, both in terms of developing prevention as well as immediate interpersonal responses to people. And I see a hurdle really actually being ignorance, that we have those tools, we have this knowledge, and an antidote is education. And I don't just mean PowerPoint training. I mean deep dives. I mean understanding the societal roots, understanding what we know about the brain, understanding what happens when somebody does experience sexual violence and tries to, to uh, report it. OK, thank you. Uh, Kishore, you're, you're a talent agent. Um, when you saw the recommendations, what, what was your immediate thought? Uh, my immediate thought is that um, uh, having systems in place where we can report uh, any kind of uh, uh, abuse uh, is crucial right now. We don't have that. And, uh, you know, we hear uh, uh, often of actors uh, being on set and performers being on set and, um, and having to face those kinds of abuse and, and reporting, um, being afraid to report anything because it may put them on some kind of blacklist or it may prevent them from uh, making a living as an actor. So we don't have any of those systems in place and we've been having these discussions amongst talent agents and casting directors and, and the people who, uh, who are on the front lines of, uh, of hearing these stories and trying to come up with a system of, of um, of, of being able to um, uh, assess situations and and um, and uh, uh, be, being able to keep track of what people have been reported on and uh, and try and uh, maintain some kind of of uh, um, our own system of, of of keeping track of who out there is being accused of. Uh, of uh, being abusers. Okay. Um, Heidi, um, are organizations prepared um, to prevent this behavior and to really tackle this? <laughs> I mean, I hope so. What, what we have right now is the first precursor of organizational change. So there's a sense of urgency that, that this has to change and this has to change now. Um, I think one thing that organizations need to do is reconcile, especially when you see sort of this the high talent or the people who are sort of in high positions of power that are tumbling, are you really saying you can't find someone who can do the job just as well who can't assault people? Because when, when you don't get rid of them, that's what you're saying. So I think prioritizing a finding, like hire a woman to do the job that this guy's doing and you'll be fine. And so making sure that you um, are putting, you're thinking about your organization, if you really are, then you would be thinking about making sure that you, have, you get rid of the assaulters. 
and making sure that if you really, because otherwise you're tied up in money, you're not really, you know, you know, we had Harvey Weinstein, you know, in power for quite a long time, and a lot of the reason why he didn't leave is because of money. But you can make just as much money with someone who is not assaulting, and you're gonna make more money because everyone else that they're holding down is now able to perform. Money exactly. Complicity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ashlyn, you're, you're a producer, you work in this space. Um, the conversations yesterday, what, what, what struck you, what were you most surprised to hear about? Well, I think the, what became clearer was the lack of clarity around what people can, what people think they can do, and what power they have. And in a, in an industry that is so hierarchical and so structured, there's not actually a system or a structure in place that is democratic to take care of everybody on an equal level, from you know the like. PA that's working one day to the, you know, the producer to the executive. So there should be one system that is clear, that works for everybody in the industry. Um, and also to go off of what Jennifer was saying as well, there's, there is, at least, in, at least in, in my industry, a complete lack of education and knowledge around what the definitions of harassment are, what is deemed as acceptable and not acceptable, what is even deemed as a workplace, you know, has, we would think that that should be something that would be relatively clearly defined, but in our industry, they're all over the place, it's a bit, of, it's a bit fluid, so having those clear uh, definitions um, would be a big start to know where the lines are drawn, and then, and then how to report. What are the systems to make that an effective, to make reporting effective, and to make it happen timely, and to make it, uh, and make it, you know, to protect the survivor, and also to um, have actual sort of restorative action? Yeah. Can so, I just add something? Oh, sure. You asked about hurdles, but I also wanted to say that we actually have an historic moment right now. There's an explosion of interest. Uh, I think there's an explosion of goodwill. There's a conversation that's opened up. There's public attention and scrutiny like we've never had, which is fantastic. We have a provincial government and a federal government that I think actually has shown incredible willingness to move this forward. So this is an historic opening, and I think we really need to push the work forward. So yes, there's hurdles, but this is a very exciting time. Yeah. There's a space, we've got to fill it. Let's move this work forward. <laughs> okay, well, on that note. <laughs> so. Um, one of the recommendations um, does speak to the need for this better re reporting process. And one of the things that struck me yesterday is um, one of the union reps in, in one of the roundtables said that um, in her time uh, as a rep, um, she's never received a single complaint uh -huh. um, from, ab about sexual misconduct from a member, um, which, which struck me because we all know that that's not the case. We've heard many, many stories um, over the last few weeks that, you know, that's obviously not the case. You know, so how can we fix that disconnect? Because um, obviously people don't want to speak. I don't know if, Nicole, you want to uh, Well, I or? think I've, what I addressed before is that we can't, we can't rely on uh, people who are within the industry to be taking these. So an independent body Absolutely is definitely necessary. the answer there. Yeah, because even if people are working sort of on the perimeter of the industry, they're still affected by it. And so having to bring a complaint uh, against somebody could affect them. And you don't know it, whether it's indirect or direct. And so uh, it needs to be somebody else, another organization that is actually trained, people who know what they're doing, mm -hmm. to take those complaints. And that, make, that we make sure that, um, you know, it's not just a bureaucratic way of, of dealing with it, but that there's also, I believe somebody mentioned, you know, trauma. People who are, who are trained in trauma who can also um, be, you can refer them, that person, that organization can refer those people making complaints to people who can help them emotionally and psychologically as well. Okay, and Jennifer. Yeah, I'd sorry. like to add. Um, so one of the domains that there's quite a bit of research and understanding and. Um, is what happens when somebody does report sexual violence. And one of the things we know is that when somebody reports sexual violence, things can get better or they can get a whole lot worse. Absolutely. So it's really important not to just jump to telling people, to, to trying to figure out how to make people report. Because 
that could actually make things worse. What first has to happen is just what you're saying. There has to be a safe reporting structure before anyone's encouraged to report. And that safety involves um, being aware of what kind of responses are harmful or hurtful. Um, and there's, there's kind of two classes of harmful responses that we need to be educated about. One of them I would call the well-intentioned responses that we might make if we don't know. Um, and these are often our, our own attempt to control our own anxiety. Mm -hmm. So we might say something that um, seems like it's going to be helpful, like, oh, that was so long ago. Um, and meanwhile, but in fact, that's invalidating and we know from research actually harmful. We might think it's a good idea to say, he did what? I'm going to go beat him up. That might be a well-intentioned sign of support. It actually, we know from research, is harmful. It's taking agency away from the survivor. The survivor's agency is crucial, absolutely crucial in this situation. These things can be taught. This is really actually very teachable. And it, really, everyone should learn this. But absolutely, the people who are taking reports. There's one other kind of harmful response we also need to be really aware of and educated about. And these are the really the bad intentioned responses. These are when people are trying to silence the person making the report. And there's an acronym I've developed that you may find helpful. It's called DARVO. And I'm sure you've seen this. DARVO stands for Deny, Attack, and Reverse Victim and Offender. This is a pernicious, harmful response. And you can pick up the newspaper, and you will find plenty of it, a lot of it south of the border right now. Oh, we have it here. Uh, it's everywhere. <laughs> um, but it's at, it's at very high levels um, at south of the border. Um, and uh, <laughs> so deny, takes the, deny is what it sounds like. No, I didn't do that. Attack is you're crazy, you're a liar, you don't um, know reality. So on. The worst part is reverse victim and offender. This is, I'm the victim here. You're hurting my reputation. You're making a fa false accusation. This constellation, DARVO, is a perpetrator strategy. And if we don't call it out, if we don't identify it, unfortunately, our research shows it's effective. It can silence the victim. It can make observers not believe the victim. So we need to be really aware of it. And when we see it, it's just like any other bystander thing. Not only do we need to disrupt sexual harassment, we need to disrupt DARVO. We need to say, cut it out <laughs> in various ways. Okay, cool. um, I wanted to touch on, um, Jumping off of that, th this idea in the entertainment industry about blacklisting, so someone who um, complains is deemed you know, difficult or a troublemaker. Um, you know, it's not limited to the entertainment industry. You, know, you hear about it in, in other places as well. Um, can we talk a little bit about, I guess, the signs to look for that that is happening, and, and, and can these recommendations actually address that, um, or do they just sweep it into another another part. Maybe, Kishwar, do you want to yeah, tackle I mean, that? It's so hard. The thing about blacklisting is that it's almost impossible to prove that someone is being blacklisted because there's always uh, so many reasons that someone does, is not working regularly. Uh, but uh, I personally have witnessed someone being blacklisted by uh, one particular organization because they wouldn't um, take a meeting in a hotel room, right? And, you know, they, and other things have happened that would um, that eventually I know that person has never worked for that organization again, right? So um, can you can you prove that that's that's the reason why they're not being hired? That's that's the challenge, right? And um, uh, I, I think um, the uh, sort of we talked about hierarchies earlier, and from the producers down to the casting directors to the agents, if we all manage to cooperate somehow and, 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 and be behind the person who's making a complaint uh, all the way down the chain, then I think uh, you know, we can probably come up uh, with a, a, a reasonable assessment of a situation and, and say, yes, that person is being blacklisted. So you're and blacklisted who, for being self-protective? Yes. 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 Wow. 
Uh, I thought we were talking about blacklisting for sexual misconduct. Uh, and, and, no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, we're talking about uh, an actor being blacklisted uh, wow. from an organization uh, who, who won't hire them anymore because they wouldn't comply with their request. For being self-protected. Wow. Yes. Right. Wow. Right. So, so, so it's they're, like, they're it's labeled, like punitive measures for being they're, self-protected. They're labeled, they're labeled difficult because, you know, and especially if they, if they went and complained about this, you know, and made a public uh, outcry of some sort, that's then outrageous. they would probably never get hired by anybody. That's right. Right? right. So are, th are, that's what we're trying to avoid. Are we at a moment, though, that because this is so, so in the public that we can break that? I, I think what's happening right now is fantastic. Right. The, yeah. the, the Me Too and After Me Too movement has taken a lot of the power away sure. from people who thought they were beyond mm -hmm. uh, reproach for, and could do anything. So now they will think, you know, a hundred times before they, they you know, if, if, if they want to blacklist someone, you know, it's not, today it's not the same thing as it was two months ago. Right? Sure. I was just going to add to what you're saying. I think part of the blacklisting problem is that all these different organizations within the industry don't know about these complaints that are being put forward. So for instance, I've had to go to multiple different organizations to protect myself from this individual. And so... That means I've had to tell my story so many different times. And I think that what we need is a unified complaint system uh, where everybody, agents, casting directors, producers, uh, everyone, uh, can know about these complaints. It's not up to the individual who's complaining to go to all these different places and say, you know, so-and-so, and retell your story over and over and over again. Um, we need to have that one sort of place that we can go to that covers all those bases. Because once those organizations know about this person, if once there's due process, once this person is found guilty, then the blacklisting is going to be much harder to, to do, to enact. They will, it'll probably be stopped because it'll be really hard for them to say, oh, well, so-and-so is just a troublemaker. Well, if everybody knows they've already been found guilty of harassment, then uh, it's going to be... I think complicity is such a huge problem yeah. in, in, in society, period. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, the first... The, the, when you go to the top level, at uh, the production level, um, obviously there's one person making those kinds of decisions and saying, oh, that person's troublemaker, we're not going to hire them. Uh, so the people around them need to, need to say, well, you know, that's not a good enough reason, and, you know, you need to to think twice about this, and then it has to go down, it filtered down to the casting people, who will also you know, hear why that person is not being brought in for, uh, you know, to, to audition for a particular job. And that should filter down to us, so we know what is going on. And, and, then, and when the knowledge is, is spread across the board, then uh, we, can, we can put an end to that. It's an astonishing statement on the compounded harms of victimization. The burdens we put on victims is just astonishing. I mean, I, I just can't believe the, the punishment yeah. that, we, that we do. It's like the secondary victimization in so many different fora. It's just astonishing to me. Can I add something? Sure. That? Yeah, so um, what you said is so true. And there is a, a bit of good news in that. It's, it's difficult to figure out how to stop interpersonal violations. Um, we've been studying this a long time, we have ideas, but it is truly difficult. But there's something much easier we can do, which is we can stop this second assault. We can stop the complicity. And the, uh, if I may be allowed to introduce two related concepts, um, institutional betrayal and institutional courage. These are concepts we've been researching. We've been able to show that institutional betrayal, which includes this second assault, it's when an institution, among other things, creates an environment where assault is permissible, and then also creates an environment where people get punished after the assault. Institutional betrayal can be measured. It can be shown that it has harmful effects. And there are, um, in institutional courage, there are steps one can take in a systematic way at an institutional level to begin to reduce these things. They include things like cherishing the whistleblower and various ways the institution can institutionalize those steps. So, the, we're, institutions are filled with adults, many of whom have power. This is something we actually can fix, and we can fix it really quickly. Mm -hmm. I think this, you're right, this is our moment to do it. That's right, okay. and we need to engage bystanders in yes. all kinds of contexts, right? We all have a duty yeah. to act. Yeah. 
All right, well, this isn't just for the very top, it's for that, all of us. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And in every context we are. And we're is, relationally what, connected in yes. our workplaces, and that is what's in our intimate relationships, in our communities. And so all, we'll, we'll get to bystanders in, in, a, in a second. Um, Haiti, I wanted to jump in. <laughs> uh, so just going back to the issue of the word difficult and blacklisting, I think something that gets lost when we talk about issues of gender is the notion of intersectionality. It is much more likely that someone who looks like me is going to be labeled difficult. And so making sure that when we are talking about these kinds of issues, recognizing that certain groups have a much harder challenge when it comes to being blacklisted and being labeled mm -hmm. difficult, in particular, black women and other women of color. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and And this is one of the this is this is one of the major scares and threats to that are that are used in our industry and I'm sure in other industries too that that if you you're you've already been victimized and then you have to come forward with this issue with your story then you have to re-expose yourself re-traumatize yourself and then you may never work again or you will always carry a uh, the 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 brand of being somebody who's going to speak up, who's going to be a troublemaker, and how do you how do you man it? How do you, how do you one weigh all of those things into even coming forward into a flawed reporting system already? So this is why there's this barrier, this culture of silence, because there is no there's not a lot of positive outcomes that come out of out of the system as it is in place right now. And there are definitely, like you know, like Hadia says, there's definitely groups of us that are much more vulnerable to to um, being put in a drawer of don't call. So, yeah, um, I see the audience is sort of some of you are trying to jump up to, to to get in. So why don't we open it up and we can kind of go back and forth? Um, can we just see the microphones? Oh, Angela, I also want to, to, to point out that we actually have a lot of the participants from our roundtable discussion here as well in the, in the front rows as well, so they want to be involved in the discussion. Okay, so we can start there, yeah. Hi. You could introduce yourself um, if you want. My name is Richard Young. I'm an uh, actor. Um, so I, I, this idea of this independent third party funded with teeth I think is very, very important. Um, that's independent and actually can make um, punitive, um, um, can actually have, have teeth and say these are the, this is what happens when you do this. Uh, the majority of work that I, uh, that I do as an actor is American productions that shoot here. And I know that there's a lot of actors that are also in that field. So my question is this independent third party, how do we make sure that it also um, will impact uh, any person from the US who's coming here, being involved in this country, and is doing harassment uh, and such that, so what sort of teeth, and how will, this, how will this organization have the teeth to make sure to stop those people from either working here or sharing information with SAG or, uh, or DG, uh, DGA, et cetera? That's a good question. It's definitely a global industry. Mm -hmm. uh, who wants to take, to take that? Are there ways that we can, you know, when people from other countries come in and, and work, how do we handle that? Or is someone from a round table able to answer that? I feel like I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the right person to answer this question, but I believe if you're on our Canadian soil, or if you're in, working in Ontario, that there are, there are laws that govern uh, the workspace here, and there's labor laws that, should, um, that they would have to abide to as well. Um, that it is obviously an issue if it's, if it's going to your specific union and you are maybe in trouble with somebody, you know, having trouble with somebody from SAG or from one of the American unions, that there needs to be this discussion amongst all of us who work in this industry because it is an international industry to have this uh, reporting system or have this shared knowledge network that has to be a part of that third party or a part of, a part of the way that the institutions work together. Um, Heidi, I wanted to just jump in. Is there a sector in your that you have found in your research that has gotten this right? A, a reporting process and a transparency? Yeah, the military in Canada, um, we were talking about this at our roundtable yesterday, has started uh, a new independent body and process, and we'll see how it works out. I mean, the military doesn't always get things right, but I say other than that, no. <laughs> okay. Because I, I would imagine every, I mean, every sector is dealing with this. You know, you've got yeah. politics, medicine. Um, Misogyny is everywhere. 
Okay. No place is immune. <laughs> uh, we've got some questions here. Is the microphone, where is it now? Oh, just we can go in the middle. Thank you. Um, from my perspective, ACRA is complicit in the increase of survivors over the year. If you want to call them survivors, I actually object to the word survivor because you're forgetting about the people who left the industry because of sexual harassment. The people who survived are represented, but the people who left, you're forgetting about. Um, and I would hope that the After Me Too movement includes them. Now, as far as I'm concerned, ACTRA didn't acknowledge that there was a prevalence of sexual harassment in the Canadian film industry until this year, and that was only after an American producer scandal hit the headlines in the United States. And I imagine and I hope that the victims over the years through ACTRA's negligence, if you want to put it that way, because whatever steps they're taking now to reduce the number they could have taken years ago. All of these in the moment things you're talking about should be old news. Now, is there, and this is where the legal comes into it, the lawyers, is there room for a class action suit against ACTRA based on the misrepresentation, the failure, the neglect, whatever you want to call it, so, so that's it. I don't, Melanie, do you want to try to take this one? <laughs> and, and I also object to the fact that you're asking people not to name names. And now there are people at ACTRA who've been in, who are the old guard, the same people who are leading the charge right now are the same people, many of them, who did nothing, who said okay, well, nothing in the past. Let's tackle the, the question. Okay. Okay. And, and There's so much to say about it. Lots okay. to say, we want to get to everyone, so. It's probably not the right forum for legal advice, <laughs> but um, I think you're I'm talking. One of the victims. No, I know, but you're probably talking about an institutional failure, and I think your point is a good one that there has been, and sort of picking up on what you're point is, I think not just in this industry, there have been institutional failures. Like I said, there's an explosion of interest now, but this is an old problem. And it's great that there's an explosion of interest now, but this problem has been percolating and humming along for a long time. It just happens to be coming to light now. So um, I think you're absolutely right. It, just because it's exploded into public consciousness doesn't mean that it's a new problem and that there's lots of uh, women who have experienced this over the years who are not at the forefront of our attention and consciousness. And I, I think that's a really good, a, a very good point. And yes, there's room for action to be taken for past, uh, you know, past incidents. Hmm. There is a remedy actually under the, at least in the Ontario Labor Relations Board called the duty of fair representation. So that's something that the union does have. There's, there's yeah. lots of legal remedies that are possible in, in the big picture sense. Union so let's go to um, the woman in, in green. Is the microphone back here? Oh. Thanks so much. My name is Margot Van Sleitman, and I'm going to speak about an industry. It is not acting, but it is also a major industry. And I was speaking with um, a dear friend this morning who said to me, well, this person actually was let go from his employment because he was an ally to individuals that were being sexually harassed. It was done in a manner, as you say, I'm sorry, Kish, that it is hard to prove that that is what occurred, but the harassment that came to him because he was being an ally to women that were being harassed was informed by what I term, and I'm sure it will not shock any of you, the old boys club. So essentially, because he spoke about it, and he was not one of the minions, as many of us are, he spoke about it, and he was let go. So I think about what Freya said this morning, and I applaud what you said, Freya, because you said, where do we go from here, and how do we support the allies, and several of the allies do not have vaginas as well. 
So my heart is breaking for this person. And the second part of that is the individuals that were being sexually harassed turned against him. And I know that that happens. And to watch the pain and the sadness and the therapy that he has to endure at this point, I believe it is a very important question. How do we support the allies? Where are the safe places? I don't believe we're there, but the conversation is happening, and I'm grateful for you, each of you. Jennifer, do you want to? Um, yeah, so this, this is a great point you're making, and it touches on many of the concepts within institutional betrayal and institutional courage, and um, specific steps we can take within our institutions regarding, um, for instance, having a structure to honor whistleblowers. Um, there are some examples of that. Um, the software industry pays people to find bugs. Now, they don't honor all kinds of whistleblowers, but that is one kind they do, and they, people get well paid for that. We can create structures that actually give people salary boosts, awards, um, for bringing to light problems. Um, we just need to do that in advance of a particular case, devote money to it, devote, devote a committee or procedure for identifying these people. That's just one of many kinds of remedies we can make. But it is very much a part of institutional betrayal that you have retaliation for whistleblowers. And it's very much a part of institutional courage that you take specific concrete steps to remedy that. It's also, it's also a shift that needs to happen in culture, too, and the part of the education that needs to happen that, that the you know the bar has to be raised of what we find acceptable and you know and you know what what we're deeming as you know uh, consent and and harassment shouldn't be muddy terms you know these should be very very clear in everyone's mind so that somebody somebody coming forward whether they are a woman or a man if they speak up on someone's behalf then they're not going to get penalized or get you know get in trouble for upsetting the status quo when the status quo is you know, not, not doing great right now, you know? So, so in terms of that re-education and re-changing, re you know, changing the culture to actually have, uh, you know, no tolerance for this type of behavior um, is gonna be part of, it has to be part of that, that re-education that needs to happen amongst everybody. Because it's not a women's issue. It's not a man's issue, it's, it's, it's everyone's issue. And he showed great courage, and I'm sorry that happened to him. That's a, that's a very sad story. It's just part of the damage and the harm that happens when people, people took, he took a, a great risk and he paid, a, he paid a price he should not have had to pay. All right, we've got a, so there's lots no and lots of boys club. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I was just saying changing the culture so there isn't an always old boys club. That's right. Probably one of the best. Right. We've got a, a question over here. Uh, on. Oh, hi. Um, Angela Asher, actor. Um, in my mind, what I think here, and I have actually posed this within our industry, is to have a type of registry. Um, also a database, uh, industry-wide, that where women or men that are filing complaints maybe don't necessarily feel that they can themselves come out, be the first one. But to, to know that other complaints have been filed against certain predators, because predators, if we all know, have a pattern of behavior that actually stems back probably decades, but doesn't come to light because we all know within our industry where money is to be made, morals go out the window. Um, I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, what I'm thinking would be the best way to handle it. All right, so a registry. What? Um, can I? <laughs> uh, uh, I think it's a great idea. The danger, of course, being that, um, um, well, it, it, uh, the, the number of, it's, it's very hard to judge, like uh, how, uh, how do you keep track, of, uh, how do you evaluate the number of complaints versus, uh, you know, um, allegations and, and, and proof and all that. 
right? But I think it's a, it's a fantastic thing. I, I would love to see that so that you know, we, have, uh, we can refer to a list of people who are um, you know, potential predators you know, or, and, and the thing is, we don't, we don't want uh, anybody who is not uh, a proven predator to be on that list. Jennifer, it's, it, it just, I, I think it's something you want. There's actually a, um, some software that's being developed and used in some universities where you can register your complaint, yeah. and then a minute another complaint against that same person happens. Yeah. It's hard to be the first person. It's much easier, like that's why we see a lot of people coming out when someone else complains, because you realize you are not alone. Mm -hmm. It is really hard to be alone. It's really hard to be the first person. And so I think working on software where you can register the complaint when it happens, and then you get some sort of trigger when it happens to someone else, and then there's solidarity in numbers. And it, it can, then you can decide whether or not to go forward or not. But those kinds of things do exist, mm -hmm. and I think trying to bring them into the media space might be a good idea. Yeah. And one of, the, um, one of the, the tables that we had this morning around, around legal, um, in a different context, but about, about evidence gathering and about what, you know, what the onus that's put on the survivor to prove their case in some kind of way, and if there was some kind of system, and I don't know what the right one is, but if there was a system of you know, anonymously reporting so that these things are being recorded somewhere, and maybe it's at a, with a third party, or maybe it's it's within the unions themselves. Maybe there's something that just registers, you know, a complaint, something, and then when these things build up, that there can be there can be action that can be taken in some kind of way because that also seems to be a faulty somewhere where there's just not a lot of uh, there's 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 not a lot of clear steps on what somebody who's been victimized does in order to have a case or to make a claim to come forward. It's it's, uh, it's not clear. Jennifer, did you want to jump in? Yeah, actually, I was going to say um, something about the software. Um, there's more than one out there, but the one that I know best and you might have been thinking about is called Callisto. That's C-A-L-L-I-S-T-O, and you can look it up. And the cool thing is it's open source software. So um, it's a nonprofit organization, but you can use their software um, if you've got the technical expertise and make your own version of it. And it's designed um, to give a lot of control to the survivor. And instead of being anonymous, there's a problem with anonymous complaints. Um, they could be used in a duplicitous way. Um, so you have to be careful because accountability really matters, but also privacy and protection matters. And it, it really um, walks that line because what happens is you get on as a survivor um, and you are guided through some questions and you can first of all document things quickly while they're fresh in your mind but you have complete privacy it's very high cyber security you have well you know I'm not in a position to vouch for that but I understand it is um, but um, the idea is that you may never share it with anybody or you may decide to share it with somebody. Well, most people are going to be motivated to share when they find out there's another victim for two reasons. One, they're going to feel they're going to be more likely to be believed. And two, because now they have evidence. We have a repeat problem, and they want to do something to protect other people, which is very motivating. So you get an alert at that point that there's another victim. And then you can decide, do you want to push it forward at that point? Maybe you want to wait for three victims. So it, I think it is not the answer to all our problems, but it is a really important tool that we should all be implementing in our institutions. I, I just want to say that's fantastic. <laughs> really. I didn't know that existed, and I, I know the organizations that I've approached didn't know that, I'm pretty sure, because I was asked personally to find other victims. As a vi I'm not kidding. Just go out canvassing the neighborhood. Pretty much. <laughs> and so, and I was kind of horrified by that, and I thought, you know, like, well, you know, if you can find other people, and I'm Another thinking, burden on you. Yes, exactly. So let me just say, when that was happening, it was like sleepless nights, and... It's a totally unreasonable request that should never have been made of you. Let's put it like that. And I'm sorry you were asked that. <laughs> you should so. never have been asked that. You should never have been put in that position. So, I'm glad to hear there's yeah. something like that. You should never have been in that position. Okay. Um, another audience question? Um, just to follow up on the, sorry, Natalie Young Lai, writer, director. Um, just to follow up on that idea of um, a registry, 
I think for myself, I would like to know who I should not work with in the future. It's a bit of protection for me. Like right now, right now we have like our little whisper network, like, you know, be careful of this guy, be careful of this person because they're, you know, they're racist, they're sexist, they're, you know, but I like to know before even getting into that situation because I don't even want to deal with them. Um, and another recommendation I would say to add to your list is to include racist violence that happens in our industry. We cannot talk about sexual harassment and sexual violence and divorce that from racism because it happens in our industry, it needs to acknowledge, and there needs to be, there needs to be a mechanism to address that as well. And right now there's nothing. And I'm not even just talking about unions and guilds because that only covers a certain number of people in the industry. And there are a lot of people who work in the industry or who are trying to get into the industry who are not part of a union. And those people are the most vulnerable. Okay, do we want to go down to this end? In the front here? Hi, my name is Mary Grogan. I'm a longtime educator and have done therapy um, counseling in schools. I have to say that there is an intersection between um, any kind of sexual or racist discriminatory assault on a person. And um, I've dealt for many years with child abuse. And it's not dissimilar in the sense of the secrecy, the shame, and the trauma, and the impact on learning and memory and all of that relationship. But I think this is a great opportunity, too, to recognize patterns or um, develop partnerships where there are practices that are exemplary practices where something is going well. I know that's a very unusual thing to say today, but um, I'm on a board of uh, directors for a place in Etobicoke called the Gatehouse. It is the only place in North America where it has a peer-supported program for victims, I shouldn't say that, survivors, who have found their voice to tell their own story about their childhood sex abuse. Um, as we say at the house, it's not a great topic. It's hard to fundraise for that because we see adults from all walks of life, all backgrounds, races, gender, all kinds of experiences who are now from young 20s to people in their 70s and 80s, sitting in group, male, female, um, people with um, uh, other issues, sitting together, working through 16-week programs and helping with the healing and they're finding their voice. So I believe that there are people in our city and people who are committed to justice and social change and we should take an appreciative inquiry approach as well to identify what partners in the city are, have been working with this kind of issue and have programs already that we can speed up processes and find programs with people who are committed, who have the knowledge of trauma and aren't necessarily um, uh, a psychiatrist and not, not necessarily a clinician, but who have actually multi-level um, experience facilitating programs with proven successful results. So partnerships is something we need to look at as well. Okay. Was that talked about at any of the roundtables yesterday, the idea of partnering up? No, I don't think not at ours. Next project. Yeah. Next project is yes. partnerships? Okay. Yeah. Um, more questions in this center? Oh, okay. Hi. Thanks so much for doing this. This is a really important forum. Uh, I'm Susanna Aiskoff, and I'm just curious, as like we're talking about the Harvey Weinstein example, none of this stuff has gone to court yet. We watched what happened when the Gomeshi case went to court, when the Cosby case went to court. What are we going to do to make sure that the women who come forward are not dragged through the mud and shredded in court? You want to take We're, uh, we're going to get an answer from one of our participants from the roundtables yesterday. Go ahead. 
So I'm a psychologist, my name's Jim Hopper, and I do a lot of work with police and prosecutors, and sometimes I get access to judges to teach them. And there's many different things that people could say in response to, your, to the question there about the court. But one of the key things is memory. One of the DARVO, which Jennifer referred to, of deny, attack, reverse victim and offender, these attacks on victims are so often attacks on their memory. And if we truly understand how memory works, and if the courts can get up to speed and understand how memory works, and if we can mandate training for judges, if we can mandate instructions to juries about how memory actually works, we can defang the standard tactic of the defense attorney, which is to attack little peripheral details that didn't even get in, that maybe the inconsistencies, as an expert who works on these cases, guess where the inconsistencies come from? They come from the investigators who are asking the wrong questions. The police create most of the inconsistencies, not the supposedly uncredible victim. So memory is absolutely fundamental in understanding how memory works and educating everyone, especially the police and prosecutors and judges, and bringing this into the courtroom. In the same way you can't say, oh, what's your sexual history? You shouldn't be able to get away with lying and manipulating about memory. And it happens every day in courtrooms around the world. So that's my point. Okay. Um, Melanie, Melanie, do you want to speak a bit about the court process that is to come next? Or, or Hedia, you've got some experience? I'm not a, I'm a labor lawyer, so okay. I'm the wrong person to ask about that. Do you want to speak to it? I'm going to be, I'm Laurie Haskell, I'm a psychologist. So in February, the Crowns have asked me to be an expert in a case where I give general evidence about the neurobiology of trauma and memory, hoping to get this in the courtroom so eventually we have what's called judicial notice, meaning that that's just understood that this is a normal process. But of course, there's a lot of um, obstacles along the way in terms of what are the arguments that I will be faced you know, looking at how to get this evidence in. Because there's already backlash. You know, we've had one, you know, we've had one backlash of false memory, and we already have another push coming where people are saying, but unless you've scanned the brain of someone who's being sexually assaulted while it's happening, everything you're talking about is just an extrapolation. Right? So you can see the kinds of arguments we need to make, but these, these are the kinds of pushes um, that we're hoping to make. Um, I, th I think we're almost out of time. If, is there anyone in the back that can verify that for me? No? Okay. One more? We've got time for one more question. Okay. Go ahead. Hello. My name is Edie Wise, and um, a best friend of mine was raped four and a half years ago in the industry, and this trial has still not been finished. So I think it's all well and good to discuss how important it is. And certainly I was the friend that really supported her to go to court and to take action. But the court system currently today, it's four and a half years. And the, um, the rapist has delayed this trial. Now it's literally still has not been done. They've said this is the longest trial they've ever seen pending. And my friend who's been the victim has experienced suicide over it because she's so traumatized. So the system we have now that is encouraging women to come forward to this day, as of now, the trial still hasn't happened and we're going into year five, January 15th to go through this trial. So I think it's just something to be aware of that when, mm -hmm. as I did support a person to come forward, there's serious consequences in that there's not all judges that force these trials to go through and they continue to give because they're so scared of appeals, they continue to give these people the opportunity to continue to delay so that they can then go back and talk about memory. So I just want to indicate there are serious implications here too. Yeah. Um, to pick up on that though, for, for the panel, you know, so many of us, if, if um, it didn't happen to us, it happened to a best friend or, or, or someone we know, what are some of the things that we can do um, to help support them whether or not they go and they, and they file a, a criminal complaint? Well, in the, immediately, you know, when somebody tells you, um, in addition to not saying the wrong things, like don't, don't um, question their judgment, um, 
don't point out it's been a long time or that they were drinking or any of those things. One can support them in the immediate situation by um, validating, um, by listening closely, by staying focused on them, and by, um, by pointing out their strengths, by saying, you know, that it, you know, it's, you, you were very strong to tell me this and so on. Um, as time goes on, four and a half years, I mean, that's quite an ordeal. And I think it points to that the, that, um, the courts aren't the right option for everybody in this particular climate of courts that we have. Often people can find other ways to um, take action, move forward that are positive and constructive for society. So I think we need to recognize that we should give people as many options and let them choose and have control over what they want to do going forward. One of the suggestions that we made actually at the criminal justice system table was to explore alternatives to the criminal justice system, which were community-based, victim-led, restorative, possibly civil, and that that's one of the directions that the work needs to go and that there's a lot of models that are out there that we need to explore. Lori and I have worked on some of those. There's lots of them in Canada and internationally, and that there's some exciting ways that we can look for more accountability, more community involvement, more restorative processes that are much more healing and therapeutic and still have accountability, and that I think that that's where we need to push the work. You know, thing that, that this community can do, and I'm going to um, pick up on something my colleague Jim Hopper was saying at our roundtable yesterday, which is you all can do something really constructive with these stories. Is you can make films, and you can make films that change the world. And that can be incredibly healing as well as constructive for everybody else. You can partner with trauma psychologists and legal experts and, and uh, make films that don't objectify women, but in fact show women in all their humanity, that explain sexual assault, explain sexual violence, and institutional betrayal, and so on. And that act of artistic production can bring as much justice, if not more, than a criminal ap approach. Yep. I think, um, Unfortunately, I've got a board here that is telling me our time is up, um, and there's an exclamation mark at the end of it, so I think they are really serious, and it's in all caps. So I want to thank um, our panelists um, for being here today, and everyone that was involved in the symposium, and, and everyone who, who came today. This conversation is far from over. Uh, there will be a lot more information going out, and the recommendations um, will be made public as well. So thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you, Mom and Dad. Thank you, Lauren. I reached out to Gabe Gonda seven and a half weeks ago, and I asked Gabe if he would hear me. Because I had tried to say something 22 years ago, and I wasn't heard. I was... I told my agents that something very bad had happened to me in a hotel room, and they told me to forget about it. And they continued to profit off of the business with this person, and he continued to systematically abuse women across the industry. And they didn't care, because it was all about the money. So I wrote to Gabe, and I asked if he would hear me, and he said yes, and he gave me a chance to speak to speak to the urgent need for reform to our policy and our legislation that does not protect survivors. I should say toothless policy and legislation. We don't want it anymore. We're tired of waiting. And what was clear to me that when the piece came out is that this was not the end, but this was the beginning, and we have a moment right now it's not my moment, it's not your moment, it's our moment. Because I guarantee you that if we don't take action, this window will close. And I'm not convinced the institutions are gonna do it. So we have to do it ourselves. We have to tell them what we need. <laughs> Hannah Sung, Craig Offman, thank you. This is not possible without you. The Globe took a risk. 
They didn't really know us, but we had this idea of bringing together the voices of survivors, the voices of thought leaders across Canada and the US, people that have volunteered our time to speak to survivor-centered reform. We have solutions. We've, we've published eight of them, but there's so many more. And we believe in transparency, and we will be releasing a report to the public. And I have been told by the Minister of Justice she will hear me. So I will be delivering the report, and I will make sure that she hears us. My only concern now is creating a path to change. Not talking about change, but actually change. Doing the work, change that protects us all because we've had enough. And I don't want to live like this anymore, and I don't think you do either. We need a path that is rational and holistic. And I want to make something very clear. This is not about the entertainment industry. This is about every industry because sexual misconduct exists in every single industry and people are not being heard and I'm sick of it. And it is our job to protect them because we are all accountable. Are you listening? Thank you.